My ministers are pro-German, my wife is pro-Italian, my people are pro-Russian. I am the only neutral in the country. This quote by Tsar Boris of Bulgaria, perhaps one of his most famous, being one relating to Bulgaria's foreign policy during the early years of the Second World War. However, it also perfectly encapsulates Bulgaria's rather interesting approach to the helmets its troops wore for the better part of the 20th century. Its first foray into this, the M36, a helmet boasting a unique yet rather familiar design. Now, if you're familiar with the German Stahlhelm and look at the Bulgarian M36, chances are good you think they are in the same helmet family. Well, in a way, they sort of are. However, the M36 helmet is often considered as something of a distant relative. It certainly was influenced by the widely known German shape. However, there were many factors that inevitably led Bulgaria to its design and creation. The story begins right before the outbreak of World War I. Bulgaria has been involved in two back-to-back -back conflicts known now as the First and Second Balkan War. Though these were relatively short conflicts, for our story they are important to know for two primary reasons. The first being the condition Bulgaria was left in afterwards, that of a nation which had to give up territory and deal with a weakened economy, and second being the massive loss of some 30 plus thousand troops, leaving the armed forces in a very demoralized state. However, less than a year later World War I began, which saw many nations being pulled in almost immediately. Bulgaria was not one of them, as it was quick to announce itself as a neutral power. However, as the fighting intensified and expanded, both sides began to realize Bulgaria was strategically located in that it could strike against Serbia and possibly convince Greece and Romania, who were still neutral, if it sided with the Central Powers, or be used as a means of disrupting connections between Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire, if it sided with the Entente, also known as the Allied Powers. Though the story is quite extensive, essentially both alliances understood the importance of Bulgaria and vied for them to join their side. This period of back and forth negotiations lasted from 1914 through the summer of 1915 and soon became known as the Bulgarian Summer. On one hand, you had the Entente nations offering Bulgaria various proposals that often included ceding lands to them, but often ended with either disagreements among themselves, complete incoherence, or Bulgaria declining in lieu of simply waiting to see. Meanwhile, Central Powers first came up with offers of Bulgaria staying neutral, but eventually got every nation involved in the talks on the same page and essentially offered Bulgaria everything it wanted. Primarily, the regions of Dobruja and Vardar Macedonia, along with Germany guaranteeing to help supply the country with materiel for the war effort. All of this and more eventually caused Bulgaria to accept, dropping their neutrality and entering the war on the side of the Central Powers in mid-October 1915. The German pledge to assist with equipping the Bulgarian army came in many ways, but one of the most noticeable was the 170,000 Stahlhelms that were made in either Germany or Austria and sent to them. This equipped about 20% of forces, the remaining either going helmetless or utilizing other helmets captured from enemy forces or acquired through other means. Keep in mind, steel helmets were still a relatively new thing adopted by most combating nations throughout the conflict. By the end of 1918, the tides of war had turned against Bulgaria as well as many of the central powers, and the mentality of the populace was beginning to go against the country's leader, Tsar Ferdinand. On top of this, a defeated Bulgarian army was determined to end their involvement in the war. As an attempt to cool down this resentment which could boil over into turmoil among the populace and returning troops, the Tsar freed opposition leaders under the plan they would help alleviate tensions. However, they pretty much did the exact opposite and assumed a form of leadership among them, eventually causing the Tsar's exile and the overthrowing of the government, which ended with his son Boris III taking control of the throne. Over the next 15 or so years, the country, operating as a democracy, would face a number of challenges and changes dealing with various political parties and ideals, which caused quite a bit of turmoil, coups, and assassination attempts. Eventually, what ended up happening was a coup in 1934 which led to Boris losing status and becoming something of a powerless figurehead. Not waiting long, he launched a counter-coup the following year, ending up with him gaining more direct control by way of restructuring the government into an authoritarian regime. Much like Germany around this time, Bulgaria was able to surpass the limitations put upon itself by post-war legislation, specifically that of the Treaty of Nuri sur Seine. This treaty essentially denied Bulgaria the right to have a conscript-based military, as well as limited the established force, including internal and border guard forces, to only about 20,000. Additionally, things like larger artillery units, tanks, and submarines were also prohibited. By 1935, though, their armed force had been greatly rebuilt with reforms and restructuring continuing. 
This is where the M36 helmet finally comes into play. As the designation suggests, the helmets were first made in 1936, however the idea and design period began in 1935, the same year Boris took power. By order of the Ministry of War, a new helmet was to be designed and developed for forces moving forward as the various World War I era ones were beginning to show their age. Being that Bulgaria and Germany had had a very good relationship economically and militarily, the design was very much based on the Stahlhelm. Aside from the obvious such as the overall shape from the dome to the flared skirt area, sometimes referred to as the neck guard or brim, things such as the larger vent lugs were inspired by the overall design. However, it also changed a few things and added a few more as well. Overall, the skirted area did not extend as far down and flared out at a more drastic angle compared to the Stahlhelm. However, the biggest difference came in the ridge or fin that ran from the front forehead section across the crown of the helmet, eventually ending at the back. Sometimes referred to as a deflector crest, this concept was not a new one as it had been seen on modern helmets, granted often in a separate metal piece rather than stamped in, since the French created the M15 Adrian helmet during the First World War. Though the uses and reasons for it varied from one country to another, one of the most universal was its intended purpose to help deflect saber strikes. But as warfare modernized, that changed towards things like small projectiles, shrapnel, and debris, as well as a way to transfer potential shockwaves from explosions by diverting them to the sides and out away from the wearer. Though the idea with this ridge would be that it would run straight along the middle of the shell, many seem to have been made slightly off-center, likely due to minor production error. And on the topic of production, this is where things get a little hairy as the story regarding their actual manufacturer varies from source to source, not to mention the fact that the helmet shells themselves bear no manufacturing stamps or markings. To preface this, it's important to know that there were three primary versions of the helmet. The M36A, sometimes called the M36-1, the M36B, or M36-2, and finally the M36C, or M36-3. That being said though, there seems to be two divergent stories of how these helmets came to be. The first and most frequently referred to story is that these three versions came about due to different production locations and years, along with slight tweaks to the design. This version states that the Type A's and B's were produced between 1936 and 1939 or so in three factories. Bruter Gottlieb und Brachbar in Brno and Sandrik in Donnehamre both of which were in Czechoslovakia, and Eisenhuttenwerk Thale in Thale, Germany. This ended with the Type C, after the specifications were solidified and solely produced within Bulgaria after a pressing machine to manufacture the shells was imported. Now, this explanation is the most circulated and referred to among collectors on internet forums, in books and publications, and generally wherever the helmet is referenced or talked about. However, the second story states that the versions were actually just steps in the refinement and evolution of the helmet, and from the beginning were all created within Bulgaria. This version says that the press to produce helmets was imported in 1935, with the Type A beginning manufacture and appearing the following year. From there, it was adjusted into the Type B, which saw production in 1939, and the eventual final update, the Type C, being seen shortly after. Now, some watching this who are familiar with the helmets may be shaking their heads or believing this is only a theory. However, it is actually the official story as it was confirmed by the Bulgarian National Military Museum located in Sofia. It seems this is one of those situations that's caused by information on a topic or item being shared and perpetuated over time, eventually leading to a general consensus that it's fact. However, it is worth saying that there may be grains of truth in the more popular story and that the other factories contributed in some way, shape, or form along the line. In fact, the alleged story behind a rare sub-variant of the Type C leans into it a bit, but we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Now, these differences appear minor from afar, but close up are much more noticeable as they come down to specifications such as weight, metal composition, rivets, and liners. We'll dive a bit into these versions, their alleged years of production and variants a little later on. But come 1937, these helmets were already well on their way into the hands of Bulgaria's forces, though it should be known many other helmets sourced both domestically and abroad were still being issued and used. By the start of the 40s though, the specifications for the M36 were pretty much ironed out, however helmets weren't Bulgaria's primary focus around this time, as much of the world was pulled into the Second World War. At the start, many nations were quick to choose sides, however, much like in the case of World War I, Bulgaria immediately announced its intentions to remain neutral. As the 40s rolled in though, Germany and Italy were invading and slowly taking over much of the area around Bulgaria. After their botched attempt at taking Greece, Germany insisted Bulgaria give their troops access to the country 
to use as a sort of staging area for Balkans-oriented operations. Concerned about invasion and hoping to use the situation to eventually gain more territory, Boris agreed to bring the country into the war on the side of the Axis powers. Though they had been on good economic relations with Germany for some time, this formal alliance granted Bulgaria access to quite a bit more war material from them as well as Italy, which may have played a part in the design of their next helmet, the M51, about a decade later. However, as the war raged on, Bulgaria proved to be something of an odd Axis member. It didn't see too much large-scale fighting and did not declare war on the USSR. In fact, it really only sent troops into already Axis-occupied regions, such as Greece and Yugoslavia. This resulted in the armed forces primarily having to deal with resistance and partisan forces within the country and the regions it occupied, as well as smaller-scale skirmishes with Allied forces, though the nation did have to endure numerous bombing raids from Great Britain and the United States. As the war in the East began to turn against Germany, Adolf Hitler met with Boris to ask for support fighting Russia, of which he declined. A few days later, on August 28, 1943, Boris was dead. Some say poisoned because of this rejection, as well as his refusal to deport Bulgarian Jews. This almost immediately led to political upheaval within the country. About a year later, Russian forces were moving into Romania. Not long after, Bulgaria's government was overthrown after briefly fighting the Soviet Union, leading to the nation switching sides and ultimately allowing Soviet forces into the country. This quickly resulted in Bulgarian troops fighting German forces in Yugoslavia, Hungary, and Austria, among others. Come the end of the war, the nation would fall under the Soviet sphere of influence, however they were a bit different when it came to military equipment, specifically that of their helmets, when lined up against other European communist countries, as was seen with the two major attempts at replacing the M36. This came in 1951 and again in 1972, both of which did not fully cause the retirement of the M36 helmet. This actually did not fully happen until the early to mid-2000s when newer Kevlar-style helmets started circulation in a much larger way. Being that the helmet had lasted in one way, shape, or form for close to 75 years, it was worn alongside a variety of uniforms and camouflage patterns. This meant a few colors and helmet covers were also used. Regarding colors, green was the most common. However, the shades varied greatly as it seems they were much darker or closer to a forest green earlier on, being altered to a sort of khaki or what some call pea green during the Soviet era, though photos show that even then, both were seen. Additionally, many were painted a light blue and issued to sailors, as well as white for military police and traffic forces. Now, it goes without saying that many users would take painting and camouflaging into their own hands and would alter their helmets to varying extents. But in addition to this, a number of camouflage helmet covers were also seen, albeit in a much more sporadic and almost makeshift way. It appears that a majority of these covers were designed and intended for use with the M5172 helmet, the one that was made to replace the M36, however it seems that they could also fit onto the M36, with the most prevalent patterns appearing to be Bulgaria splinter and frogskin camouflages, though others have also been seen. The last element to look at with these helmets are decals. Since the helmet's inception way back in the mid-1930s, quite a number of them were applied. Early on, the helmets frequently had an emblem printed on their right side, which emulated a style similar to that of Germany's, in that it boasted the national colors displayed diagonally almost 45 degrees within a shield. This for a time was a standard, however by 1940 the practice seemed to have ceased, at least as far as them being put on in an official manner. However, the practice of adding the emblem on the side never truly went away but rather just changed. Moving away from being printed in a German style, newer ones were either hand-painted or stencil-painted on, and though some versions were seen that copied the older design, many saw the shield shape being altered, with the colors being painted horizontally rather than at an angle. Being that it wasn't an official practice, but rather a likely unit or even individual choice, many different versions came to be. As far as the reason for the changes in the actual design, some say it was to distance it from the axis influence style, while others say it was just a practice done infield, with the design being altered to one that could be painted or applied much easier. Painting straight 90 degree colors is far easier than diagonally angled ones. Once they were aligned with the Soviet Union and communism, the inclusion of a red five-pointed star began to be seen on the front of most helmets. In fact, there are even cases of the shield and star on the same helmet. The final changes came in the 1990s with the removal of the red star. However, right around this time, some units also began to add a lion, the central piece of the country's various coat of arms since 1879, on the front. However, it was quickly stopped due to it being often painted a bright white or even yellow, thus causing safety concerns. 
With the history of these more or less out of the way, let's actually take a look at the different versions of the M36, as well as talk a bit about how things changed during its very long lifespan. As stated before, there were three versions, the A, B, and C. So, naturally, let's start with A. It was the heaviest of the helmets and, among the three versions, had the most pronounced visor, as it appeared to stick out the farthest, which was due to the rolled edge that was seen on the inside. Both this and the flared skirt seem to have stemmed from early Stahlhelm models. The outside featured two lugs for circulation as well as six rivets, four large ones for the helmet liner, and two for the chin strap. These will almost always be seen in the darker green paint, though it's possible some were repainted with the newer lighter shade as well. A parade version of this helmet was also created. These were virtually identical but were aluminum rather than steel, and supposedly included a more comfortable liner made out of softer leather. Next up is the M36B, which had the nominal difference of the removal of the rolled edge around the helmet instead opting for a raw, also referred to as a cut, edge. Now, there were two variants of the M36B, the Type 1 and Type 2. The differences between these was quite simple. Type 1 saw five rivets, two for the chin strap and three for the liner, while Type 2 saw six, two for the chin strap and four for the liner. The cause of this isn't exactly known, but the Type 1s with the five rivets again harkens back to the M16 Stahlhelm, as that too only had five. The M36B Type 2 may have also been an attempt to more uniformly and structurally secure the liner, or was just a simple difference of production. Finally, we have the M36C, the lightest and most common of the three. These were the most different as they toned down the lip of the visor and slightly adjusted the angle of the skirted area. This one sees the most variations due to its length of production and usage but it is also the easiest to identify in that it is nearly identical to the Type B, but sees the six rivets shrunk down quite a bit. Inside the shell, the liner was slightly changed, being suspended due to the attachment points being moved much closer to the edge. This was to help improve wearer protection and just make it a bit more comfortable. The easiest way to tell are the metal rectangular shaped tabs that run from the rivet points to the liner itself. Sometimes they'll appear as their original silver, but are often painted the same color as the shell. Technically, there is a subvariant of this type, which is often referred to as the M36C short visor, which is a sort of general nomenclature for a shorter and generally smaller version. These are essentially the same as the Type C, with the primary difference visually being the visor not sloping down from the skirted area as much as the standard one. Beyond that, it's nearly identical when it comes to things like rivets, vent lugs, and the liner inside. Now, the reason these were made is a bit hard to say, however, the most prevalent and likely story relates to Germany's occupation of Czechoslovakia. The story goes that after Germany invaded the remainder of Czechoslovakia in early 1939, it took control of the factories that were producing Czech M32 helmets, and as such at some point offered the already made shells to Bulgaria, which were then repurposed into short visor versions. Most of them seem to be perfectly made, though some have claimed to have encountered asymmetrical ones. This can likely be explained in that much of the modifications were done by hand, that being the bending out of the visor and skirted areas, as well as filling in the original vent and rivet holes and drilling out the others. Finally, the shell would then be run through the press to add the ridge along the crown, with the final product being an almost identical shrunk down version of the M36C. They are considered the rarest of these as they were produced in the fewest numbers. Now, regardless of version or variant, the liners and chin straps inside are something else. Over the years and because of various models, there are numerous iterations and combinations. This is in part because of the changes in how they were attached, as well as continual use through the Cold War, meaning older helmets would see newer liners and or chin straps added in. Take for example this, an M36A, B, and C. Inside all three of them have the same liner, though the way it's mounted is different, showing that though the A's and B's stopped production before the end of the war, already existing ones continued usage for many years after. A good general rule of thumb to tell with the leather inside is if the chin strap is thinner, only riveted and or has a split in the middle, along with larger or more than one buckle, it's an older one, as newer ones were often stitched and were wider. As for the liner, older ones often had a larger or separated, often through one or more stitched areas, headbands, along with fewer straps, also called tongues, that had little to no vent holes. Newer post-war ones, on the other hand, will see a shallower band area, along with a larger number of small tongues, with many more holes. Additionally, one thing to note is a seemingly sporadically used oval-shaped leather pad that was attached to the top of many shells underneath the liner, likely as an extra layer of cushioning and protection. Last but not least, it's worth noting that things like vent lugs and sometimes rivets will appear in slightly different shapes and sizes, which likely coincides with where and when they were produced. 
And that will pretty much do it for Bulgaria's first original modern day helmet. Now, as with many items out there, a lot of information is scattered and up in the air, especially the two different tales surrounding the helmet's origin. So hopefully this video has helped shed some light on the subject, as well as provided a sort of guide when it comes to figuring out what versions are out there and the differences between them. The M36 today is often considered the cheapest and most overlooked Axis helmet. Oftentimes when you think of World War II helmets, you immediately think of the German M35, US M1, British Brody, or Soviet SSH-40. However, there were numerous ones fielded by many other armies and forces that fought in the war. The M36 is arguably one of the most peculiar due to its inspiration, origin, extended usage, and, perhaps most interestingly, that it was a helmet that was officially designed and worn by a nation that fought on both sides of the Second World War. But if this video proved enjoyable, entertaining, and or informative, why not leave a like and subscribe? If you don't feel like it, that's okay. Just be sure to check back soon for more of the history of right here on Uniform History.